Amen. So I'll get into exactly what it is I'm preaching about here uh, in a minute, but I just want to start out and kind of preface the sermon a little bit and just kind of start out by saying by way of introduction and just making the point that, you know, when we preach and when we come together to church, uh, we cannot overemphasize the importance of doctrine. You know, there's a lot of churches out there that'll preach everything under the sun except anything that is doctrinal. And a big reason for that is because of the fact that doctrine, you know, divides people. When you start to preach doctrine, uh, you know, people have to kind of determine whether, what it is that they believe uh, based on the Bible, whether they're going to accept what the Bible says or whether they're going to reject it. And if you would, keep something there in Acts chapter 2, but uh, go ahead and turn over to 3 John chapter 1, 3 John chapter 1. You know, the, the doctrine is something we can't overemphasize enough. It's something that needs to be preached. We need to have doctrinal sermons. We need to learn the Bible. We need to understand uh, what kind of stands we need to take on the Word of God. And it's very important. In fact, it's so important that, you know, it divides people. Even, even within, not just uh, amongst, you know, uh, just people in general, but even in, in some, often, sometimes, even within a home. We'll see here in a minute. But uh, you're there in Third John, look at chapter 1, verse 9, where it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, uh, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So the Bible's saying here, look, if a guy brings the wrong doctrine about concerning the doctrine of Christ, another gospel, a, a false gospel, if you would turn over to Galatians chapter 1, he says, look, it's not even enough that you just disagree with that guy. You shouldn't even bid that guy Godspeed. You know, when they're bringing another gospel to your door like the Mormons do, like the Jehovah Witnesses do, uh, you know, if they bring a false gospel that preaches a works-based salvation, which they do, you know, it's not enough for just say, say to them, hey, I, I'm not interested. Have a nice day. The Bible says you shouldn't wish from hap have a nice day. Look, I'm not saying you have to get up in their face and, 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 and you know, up one side and down the other and, and let them have it, but the Bible's really clear. Do not bid those type of people Godspeed. Why? Because they don't have the right doctrine. So you can see how important doctrine is. And, uh, doctrine is something that we need to focus on in a church. And it divides people. Look here in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from the, uh, him that called you into, the, into this grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we uh, said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel unto you that you have not received, let him be accursed. He says, don't bid these people Godspeed. In fact, let them be accursed. Amen. Go over to Matthew chapter 10. So we understand that, you know, that's, that's, that doctrine divides, you know, within, uh, you know, religions. It'll divide us, uh, you know, and, and down uh, denominational lines, what we believe, what we're willing to accept as the truth, and what we're going to reject. But it also, you know, doctrine can even divide within a house itself. Look there in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus said, Think not I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. If I come, and, uh, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's saying don't love them. He's not saying don't love them. He's saying you can't love them more than me. But we see here that, that Christ came to divide even within a home. So, and what is it that we're dividing over? Doctrine. So we can't overemphasize the importance of doctrine. And, you know, it's a, that's a hard saying in Matthew chapter 10. A lot of people don't like that, that Jesus came to bring a sword and he would divide even sometimes because of the word of God, a home itself. Amen. And you look there and, and look at verse 38. It's no coincidence that he follows it up with verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You know, being divided in, in a, you know, separated from family, those that you love and, and care about and have made memories with, you get saved maybe in later in life and all of a sudden you're taking stands, you're, 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 you're starting to have, uh, you know, develop uh, standards in your life, you're having, you're, you're taking, making sound convictions based on the word of God, you know, that might cost you some family. That might, you know, I'm not saying you can never talk to them, but it might, things might not be the same. There might be a sword there now. And you know what? That's your cross to bear. That's a cross that you have to bear, and that's why Jesus follows it up with verse 38. He that cover, taketh not his cross and followeth not after me is not worthy of me. That division often in our life is a cross that we must bear. So, you know, doctrine is something that's very important. And if you look back there in Acts chapter 2, go back to Acts chapter 2 and keep something there. 
We're going to look at it a few times tonight. But, uh, you know, doctrine is important, you know, not because the, cause we see the, the, the grave consequences here, the serious stands that must be taken for the sake of doctrine, as we just looked at, but also because it's part of a formula that made the early gr uh, church great. Doctrine is what helped make the early church what it was, that soul-winning powerhouse that we read about in Acts chapter 2, when, the, when, they, when they were just spreading the gospel throughout every, into every corner of the world. Look there in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's important, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So what's the, what's the formula there? It's doctrine and fellowship. Look, we can't overemphasize doctrine. And in fact, even sometimes I think in our churches, we get so focused on doctrine that we forget a little bit about the fellowship. And doc doctrine is important because it, 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 it divides us. You know, because the doctrine divides us, as we saw there, you know, out of the words of Christ himself, that we even, even off sometimes it might even be required in the home itself. Because doctrine is so important and because it divides us, it makes that second part of that formula all the more important. The fellowship. That's the doctrine and the fellowship. Those are the two things that made the early church great. It wasn't just all doctrine. It was also the fellowship that they had one another. And when you think about it, when doctrine begins to divide you and you have to start letting go of maybe old friends, old relationships have to fall away because you're following, you got saved, you're following Christ now, and, the, and the, you know, the old, the old people, your old life, they want to pull you back, they want to pull you away from that, living godly in Christ Jesus, they don't want you to do that. You know, it makes those that are going to be there with you all the more precious. It makes the fellowship that you do have all the more important. That part of the formula becomes more important. When you start to let that doctrine divide, you have to have the fellowship. You've got to add that second part. You know, doctrine might cost us a precious relationship, or may maybe more than one, that we hold dear. You know, people say, I can't believe you believe that now. You believe that? I can't believe that that's what you think God is, or that's who Jesus is to you. Well, that's what the Bible says, and I have to be true to the Bible. Yeah, yeah. And thus saith the Lord. Right. And that divides people. And when that happens in our life, you know, that second part of the, fo the formula, the fellowship, should become even more precious to us. And that's really uh, what I want to preach to you about tonight, is find time for fellowship. Find time for fellowship. That is the title of the sermon. So fellowship, as we saw there in Acts 2, is a uh, is a is also a part of the formula, and that should not be overlooked. You know, of course, we understand that doctrine is important, but we also should remember the fellowship that we are to have in Christ with one another. <laughs> it says there in verse forty-two, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You know, them sticking together, them coming together, and having that one thing in common, Christ, and coming together in the local church. That's what made them great. I mean, they all had the right doctrine. They had that fellowship in doctrine, but they had fellowship one with, one with another too, and they were able to do great things for God. And that's what made them great was that sticking together. And you know, the same is true in our own lives. If we're going to accomplish great things for Christ, if we're going to be the soul winners and the Christians that we're supposed to be for God and, and live godly like we're supposed to, we're going to need the fellowship of the local church. We're going to need to develop relationships and friendships with one another who have also, you know, other individuals who also have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in them. And uh, it's important. Go ahead and go back to Acts chapter 4. You know, you don't want to get this attitude in life, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. You don't want to get this attitude in life that you're going to be this lone ranger for Christ. It's not going to work. That you're, you know, you're just going to be this lone wolf, that you're just going to serve God all on your own. You don't need the church. You don't need friends. You don't need the fellowship. You know, you know all the doctrine, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. You know, that's not going to work. You need fellowship in your life. You need to make time, you need to find time for fellowship. You're there in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, let's look at verse 9. Well, while you're turning there, I'll remind you, I mean, you know, Genesis 2. And the Lord God, uh, Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. You know, God doesn't want us to be lone rangers. God doesn't want us to be these you know, just lone wolves, you know, all, all by ourselves kind of Christians. He wants us to have, have others. Of course, we know that's referring to the fact that he needs to have a wife, but we can apply that as well, that God doesn't want us to be alone. He says there in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his, fault, his fellow. 
But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can they one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. This scripture is telling us that, hey, it's good to have, it's good, to, it's good to have more than one. You know, one might be okay, but hey, two's better. You know, it's showing us that fellowship benefits us. We should find time for fellowship because of the fact that it benefits us. You know, we glean from that. And we've already seen it. You know, in 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 Acts chapter 2, what fellowship, doctrine, and fellowship led to, you know, great works being accomplished, God adding thousands to the church, the gospel going out powerfully at that time. And uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 shows us that fellowship is what keeps us going. I mean, if you look there in verse 10, notice it says, for if they fall, they both have fallen. You know, the two have fallen. It's not just the one guy fell. It says, if they fall. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. They both fell, but one lifted up the other. You know, sometimes it's hard to get up, but if, if, if one person will, and then get the other guy back on his feet, and they can keep going. You know what that shows me is that we're all facing the same obstacles. You know, there's nothing that's coming into your life as a Christian that we aren't experiencing as well. Maybe not at the same time. Maybe we haven't yet. But, you know, you're going to go things in your Christian life that other Christians are going to be able to relate to. You know, you're going to fall in this area. You're going to struggle with this obstacle. Well, you know, this brother or sister over here is, 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 has gone through it or is going through it or will go through it. And that's why you need to make time for fellowship so that one can lift up the other. Amen. Hey, I've been where you're at. I've gone through what you've gone through. I know what's that like. Let, let me give you some counsel. Let me give you some help. Let me encourage you. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> They're both facing the same obstacles. And maybe next time it'll be the other way around. You know, maybe you're going through a hard time this time. But now that you've gone through that, when somebody else goes through that difficult time, you can say, hey, I've, I've gone through that too. That's why finding time for fellowship is important. Because here's the thing, we're all going to fall. No one's going to be perfect. You know, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to go through struggles. But when you fall alone, you know, it, it, it may lead to you quitting. I'm going to be a lone ranger for Christ. And, the, you know, and then you mess up. You know, you fall short. You make a mistake. I don't need the local church. You go through some obstacle, some difficulty, some trial. You have no fellowship. You have no encouragement. You have no help. They just may lead you thrown in the towel. Say, well, you know, enough to this. I'm going back to the world. That happens to people all the time. <coughs> so Ecclesiastes 4, it shows us that fellowship is what keeps us going. And it shows us that, you know, really here, even in the physical sense, it might spare our lives. I mean, it's kind of, hopefully we never find ourselves in this situation where, you know, if it says in verse 11, if two lie together, then they have heat. You know, hopefully we're never in some, I don't think we're ever going to be have a problem down here in Tucson with this, right? <laughs> you know, you never know. Maybe next year at the camping trip, some storm blows in, all the tents go away, and we're up there in some blizzard. I'm just kidding, but, you know, but we could apply that spiritually, right? Amen. You know, if we stick together, we can, we can uh, you know, in, in encourage one another. We can give each other that spiritual heat, that fervor to continue on for Christ. You know, when, when the world, the love of the world is growing colder and colder, you know, we need the warmth of Christ's love within the local church to keep us on fire for Him. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead and turn over to uh, Ecclesiastes. Well, just stay there in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, you know, it shows us that, you know, fellowship is important because it benefits us. <coughs> You know, it, it benefits us. It helps us keep us going. It may, you know, keep our hearts warm, keep us from growing cold. And, you know, it shows us really that we're going to have an easier time in adversity when we're going through those struggles, when we're going through those trials. We're going to have an easier time in adversity. Look at verse uh, 12. And he says, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. You know, and we're living in a time today where there's a lot of people that want to stand against us. There's a lot that want to try and prevail over us today for believing what we believe about the Bible. That's it. What's, what's our great crime? Well, we believe what the Bible says. I mean, pick the topic. You know, and, and the world is, you know, the whole world lieth in wickedness, the Bible says. And, and, they, they, and they, they, they don't like the Bible in this world today. They never really have, I think, honestly. You know, they're not all excited that there's an independent fundamental Baptist church like this in Tucson. I mean, if they were, where are they? You know, why aren't, why aren't, why aren't we running out a shopping mart yet? You know, an old shopping mart. Why isn't this church 300 times bigger than it is right now? Because they're not excited about it. You know, maybe one day enough people will find out about us and get saved and want to come and we'll grow. But, 
You know, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people are not excited about the things of God. In fact, they oppose the things of God today. They hear it, they're like the, the Jews there in, 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 the, in, in, in Paul's day. They want to run upon him and gnash upon him with their teeth. I mean, think about Stephen, right? In, in Acts 6, where he, he stands up and preaches. Or maybe it was Acts 7. And what do they do? Oh, you're right. Let's all get right with God. No, they run upon him. They stone him. I mean, they killed Christ. You know, they, they're not exactly uh, excited in the world today about the things of God. You know what that tells me is that we need to find fellowship in the local church. Amen. If we're going to make it, if we're going to endure, if we're going to live a, a victorious Christian life, if we're going to have joy along the way, you know, this church is, should be dear and precious to you if that's what, you're, what you value in life. You know, the relationships that you make in this church should be important. That, and, you know, because there's so much you could benefit from it. Because you're not going to find that out. No one out in the world is going to encourage you in Christ. You know, the, the lost guy at work isn't going to, you know, find out that you don't drink or whatever because you're a Christian and say, oh, that's great. Right. You know, you should keep doing that. You know what a lot of times what they try to do? They try to say, oh, you're a Christian. You have that. You don't drink, you know. Then, uh, then, then they just get emboldened. They're like, well, I'm going to try and see if I can get you to slip. Oh, you don't do that? Well, I, you know, I do. Let me see if I can get you to do it. Right. It becomes like sport to them. It becomes a game to them. You know, They're not all going to just be all excited and start waving the, the banner like, you go for Christ. <laughs> rah, rah, just applaud you on. Is that what's going to happen in an unsaved world? No. We don't expect that. We don't hold that against them. We just understand that's the way it is. But the point is, is that that should make this, what we have here, all the more important, all the more dear to us, all the more precious to us. Because here we can walk in and someone will encourage you in Christ. You know, to keep going for Him, to keep reading your Bible, to keep going soul winning, to, to keep being a witness, to keep living a righteous life, to keep the sin out of your life. Because you know there's a group of people that are going to encourage you to continue to do that. That's why it's important to find time for fellowship. Fellowship is what's going to make you a better Christian. You know, there's strength in numbers. It says there a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, if you were to take like some dental floss, you could probably just snap that. Well, most of us could. Right? <laughs> just kidding. Probably everyone here could, right? You could just snap that dental floss. Well, what if you like wound up several strands of dental floss? Yeah, you could probably still could, but it'd be a little bit harder, right? It's kind of like trying to fold that, that newspaper. You can't fold a newspaper more than like seven times or something like that. Or, you know, you just think about a great big bridge, like a, like a cable suspension bridge. You know, these huge, massive structures just weighing you know, thousands and thousands of tons that are just have cars driving and semi-tractors just, you know, transporting people over it. All this weight that it's bearing, it's all being held up by strands of cable. And it's not just one individual strand. It's all these, what makes them strong is the fact that it's a multitude of strands woven together. And when they're all together, they can support that weight. You know, it's the same way spiritually in your Christian life. We need to come together and we, so that way we can bear a bigger burden. You know, filling in the map, you know, going knocking on the doors in the city of Tucson, that's a big job. That's a big burden to bear. One man's not going to do that. Two men aren't going to do that. Even in a lifetime, I don't think a two, uh, one or two guys can do that. That's going to take a group of people. Right. We're going to come together and encourage one another to stay faithful in that area and continue to go out and preach the gospel. So fellowship is important. You should make time for it because it's going to make you a better Christian. The Bible says in Proverbs, and if you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. It says in Proverbs 27, verse 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so sh uh, a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth countenance of his friend. You know, it says it sharpens his countenance. You know, that's the way you look, the look on your face sometimes. You know, anyone that's been married for any length of time can tell when their spouse is not in a good, they just, one look. Oh, she's in a mood. <laughs> you know, oh, he's mad. You know, just because of the countenance, right? And you know, when, when, but here's the thing. It says when, you know, iron sharpening iron, it's the same substance, iron sharpening iron. You know, when we get together as Christians, our attitude a lot of times changes. A lot of times we get together here and, and you know, the, we, maybe something happened that day, we're upset about something during the week, something's been bothering us, but then we get around fellow believers and we're reminded again, you know, of, of the truth of Christ, of what we have. And all that other stuff just kind of melts away. And it lifts our spirits. You know, it sharpens our countenance. <coughs> uh, look there. Uh, you're in Hebrews 10. So, you know, again, I'm trying to keep it short tonight just because of 
the chili and everything like that. And we we want to get back to it. And and uh, <laughs> after all, it's called let make time for fellow or, or find time for fellowship. So let's find some tonight, right? We already know we already had a little bit. Let's have a little bit more before we go, right? <laughs> And the point I really want to make is, you know, it, fellowship's important. Doctrine, yes. You know, these, these things go hand in hand. You should have both. But fellowship's important, too. And you can see how important it is and how precious it is because you're not going to find the fellowship uh, that you need out in the world. Where are you going to find it? Here, in the local church. And uh, that's why, you know, the local church is important because that's what's going to provide you with the fellowship that you need. That you need, not that it just it's optional. Like, yeah, it'd be nice. I could take it or leave it. No, you need it, friend. That's what's going to sharpen you. That's what's going to you know lift you up when you fall. When you fall, that's what's going to continue to 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 be able to bear the burdens that you have to bear in the Christian life. Uh, is when you have that fellowship that you need, and that's found here in the local church. You know, the, and I'll say, you know, just the services alone are enough to encourage people. You know, to be perfectly honest, my wife and I, we got several kids. We don't spend a lot of time outside of the church with, with people. You know, my wife has some friends. You know, I, I talk to some friends. We hang, I'm not saying we're shut-ins or recluses or anything. That's just the nature of life. You know, but we get a lot of fellowship just within the, the three, four services that we attend a week to keep us going. I mean, we've developed friendships there. We have, you know, friendships here and, and people, and, and, and it's encouraging. And, you know, church, that's what church does for you. And I say it's fine time for fellowship. Am I saying, hey, you need to get together with so-and-so and play Scrabble? No, but it'd be fun, right? You know, if you're into Scrabble, I don't know, maybe you're a Monopoly guy. <laughs> whatever. You know, or do whatever, you know, have some fellowship. That's great. I'm all for it. But, you know, you get a lot of that right here. That's what the local church provides for you is fellowship that you need. <clears throat> and the services alone can be enough to encourage you and get, keep you going. You know, we should desire to hold fast to that. Look there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You know, God wants us to hold fast, to not let go, to not fall away and get washed back out into the world. I mean, we know we're going to go to heaven because salvation is by grace through faith. Well, what kind of life do you want to live on the way there? You know, I want to live an exciting Christian life that accomplishes something for Christ. I want to get to the end of my life and go to heaven and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's why I need the fellowship here. That's why we need one another to encourage one another. We need to hold fast to it. You know, your fellow Christians is going to help you with that, with that holding fast, with that, without that, with, to keep you from wavering. You know, hey, brother, I see you're struggling here. You know, I've noticed, you know, you, you know, I just want to shore you up. <clears throat> And he goes on and says in verse 24, let us consider one another. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The church is where that takes place. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What is the assembling of ourselves together? That's church. That's where all these things take place. That's where it, you know, you're going to learn to hold fast. That's what's going to help you not waver. That's what's gonna, where you're going to consider one another. That's where you're going to be provoked to love and to good works, or maybe do the provoking, is right here in the local church. So, you know, find time for fellowship. Don't, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's important. We need it if living, you know, the Christian life is what's important to you. Living the life that God would have you to live. If that's what matters, then you need the fellowship that's here. Don't forsake the fellowship because here's what happens. If you forsake the fellowship, you will fade away. That's what happens. You know, this is... I'm a young man, I've been around that long, but you know, I've been in church like this for 20 years. And I've seen him come, I've seen him go. And I'm not trying to make him say, oh, look at me, I'm still here. I'm just saying, that's what happens. And it doesn't happen overnight. People slowly start to fade away. You know, they start to slowly back out. And then next thing you know, where's so-and-so? Have you seen him? Have you seen her? Do you know where they're at? I haven't heard from him. And that's how it happens. So I don't want to see that to happen to any of us. I want, us to, I want this body to continue to grow. And, and not just so that we can sit around and, and stare at one another's face and, and slap each other in back and tell, how, tell one another how great we are. But so that, because the more people that are here, the more we accomplish for Christ. Amen. And the more we can be an encouragement to one another. Don't forsake the fellowship. Don't fade away. Let's go ahead and pray.